welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 205, featuring the second part of my interview with Mr. Bill Volk, an industry veteran with over 30 years experience. This part of the interview, we focus in on his early days in the industry, back when uh, computers like the Trash 80 Commodore PET and Apple II were the platforms of the day, and a company called Avalon Hill was doing something really peculiar by putting games into boxes rather than plastic baggies. A lot of great stuff in this interview, so without further ado, here is Mr. Bill Volk. Well, Bill, I see you're quite the educated man. I was looking at your bio, and you seem to have uh, degrees in physics, yeah. astronomy, computer engineering. I'm yeah, just wondering, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, are those masters or PhDs, or what, what's going I have on? A, I, have a, I have a master's in computer engineering and physics from the University of New Hampshire. It's kind of, yes, I completed my master's. They say I have a master's. I don't have the parchment, so I don't know what that means. I, I left that because I was doing games independently. I, was, I had sort of completed the course requirements. And then I was offered a job in California where it was like, I don't want to leave grad school unless you pay me X. And they said, sure, we'll pay you X. And they flew me out to Vegas, and I started working on this drawing program, integrated software system called Valdox in 1982. And I did that for two years before I got entranced by the new Macintosh and started doing Macintosh games at the very end of 84. But, yeah, um, that's why I left grad school. It was, uh, it was that. But I was actually... I did my undergrad at Penn, I got a degree in physics and astronomy, did a year at Maryland, and then I, at Maryland is where I got into the game industry because it was the, the Christmas of 79, uh, I was looking for something to do over break, saw a, um, a posting for t play testing games at Avalon Hill, computer games, went there, play tested them, and that set the whole thing off. Sheer lucky, sheer luck, sheer random chance. I. Literally looked at a, a kiosk. There was a piece of paper. I called them up. I started playtesting games. I said, hey, you know, we could do better graphics in this. And they said, prove it. I did Conley 2500, the first game I ever wrote on those platforms. And there you go. How lucky can you get? And if I would say to anyone what to learn from that is, if you're an independent gamer and you're making any kind of success of games, I would urge you to keep doing it. I should have, in retrospect, just stayed independent and just kept doing games because it was fun and, and, and it paid the bills. But I, um, I wanted a career, which I ended up doing, but you know, I wish I'd actually stayed independent back in the early 80s because it was fun. It was very fun to do games on your own. You know? Let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about Avalon Avalon Hill. This, I was kind of yeah. curious if you could sort of set the stage for me and tell me what, what it was like there and who were the people. Okay, so the Avalon Hill company was run by the Dot family. There was... Eric Dot and Jack Dot, and uh, I'm trying to think of the other guy, but there was an older man named Mr. Dot. I think it was Jack Dot. Eric was his son. It was another son. And what happened is, in the 50s, they started Avalon Hill, and it was very vertically aligned. People don't understand this, but Avalon Hill started as a board game company in the 50s, and they owned a company called Monarch Printing, which was in the same area in Baltimore. So they were printing their own stuff. That was their big advantage. They, they basically were completely vertically integrated in the board game market. I would, came in 79 to play test their first computer games, and their very first computer games were basically mainframe games ported to personal computers. So you had Nuke War and B1 Bomber, which was basically text. Text scrolling up, text um, displays of maps and stuff. And this, the only thing I would say is kind of weird is the board game people didn't really interface too much with the video game people. I wanted to do, well, the crazy story is in 19... 80 or 81, I asked, I said to them, we should do Squad Leader, we should do World War II online, we should have a server, uh, a mainframe, I said, and we should write programs on the Apple II and the TRS-80 that put up maps and stuff and talk to the, the mainframe, and we should have this ongoing turn-based war game going on at all times. And they looked at me like, you're out of your mind. And it, it was a crazy idea for that era, but of course, eventually, Genie and Kesmai would start doing stuff like that. Um, so, okay, what was the atmosphere like? It was really cool because Avalon Hill had people in the company who were not just war game people. They had lived war games. So, like there was one guy there who was one of their game designers who had been in World War II, and he could tell me stories about being in the back of a B-17 and having an ME-262 jet approach him. And he said, I think his quote was, it was like aliens. Like we didn't know what it was. You know, they were like terrified because – you know, they're flying along at 150 miles an hour, and suddenly a plane comes by at 600 miles an hour, and you're wondering what the hell it is, you know? 
So th there was a lot of deaf and experience. And I think the Avalon Hill people were very nice to work with. There was a guy who sort of was in charge of the computer game division. He was a pleasure. It was, it was really a good bunch of sweet people who were easy to work with. And it was a lot of fun. I, I remember play testing Chris, uh, um, who's the great, the great game designer, uh, the guy who founded the uh, computer game developer conference. Um, God, I can't remember his name now. It, it, uh, he did um, um, uh, uh, Balance of Power, uh, Chris Crawford. So Chris Crawford had a game called uh, Tanktics that Avalon Hill had done as initially as a board game in the 50s that he did as a computer game. And he actually had the game where it's shipped with a game board and you played with the computer but used the game board. That was pretty clever. And then he went on to do um, a game called Legionnaire, which was also released as Eastern Front from Atari. And that was brilliant. So we got to work with some really good people. There was an adventure game called um, Lords of uh, Karma, which I thought was a superb text adventure game. And uh, what I was trying to do with Voyager was to build a sort of first-person, real-time, 3D adventure game. And really what it was was a sort of first-person, lock point-of-view, wireframe shooter, which is what it really was. And, um, and that, was, that, was, that was my most successful game at Avalon Hill in terms of overall success. The most crazy game at Avalon Hill was Controller because it was something I did with a friend who was a Navy controller air traffic controller, uh, air boss, and it was uh, basically done quickly, and then the strike hit with Reagan firing the controllers, and it actually had some success right away. It actually made us money, so it was kind of cool. Yeah. Well, Avalon Hill was fun. Coming back to Conflict 2500, your, your first ever uh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was looking at, the, <laughs> looking at the box. I got the box on movie games, and I, was, I noticed you could play this with up to 10 people. <laughs> I don't know if that – does it really say that? I, yeah. Oh, okay. Here's how – here's what they meant. There are up to 10 ships under your command, so you could actually do cooperative play. You could have each person run their own ship on the same computer. So you, you set up a scenario that says, how many ships do you have? How many ships does the enemy have? So if you said you had 10 ships, everyone could play a ship. You just say, okay, I'm done with my ship. You do your ship. Okay, you do your ship, right? And the ships could refuel each other. They could go to bases. They could attack the enemy. You could actually tell people what was going on in your sector because um, you, could, you could bring up a map. Uh, a radar map from every ship in your fleet. So most of the time people played it on their own with multiple ships, but yes, it was possible to actually have 10 players do it. By the way, the whole game, Conflict 2500, was inspired by Star Blazers, otherwise known as Spaceship Yamamoto, an anime series that was airing on TV in the United States the summer of 1980. Do you, do you know it? Oh, yeah, sure. So I watched that show, loved that stupid show, and I basically inspired me to do Conflict 500. I, what I want to do with Conflict 500 is take the, the, the traditional Star, War, Star Trek game that was very popular um, back in the day, in the 70s. So I, I played it on the Commodore Pet when I was at Penn in 1977, 78. And I wanted to make it richer by having multiple ships, by having bases, by having mines, uh, by having uh, planets, and having an enemy... I had taken AI classes in grad school. So the enemy AI in Comics 100 was sophisticated. It was a, um, a learning system. Basically, every time the enemy would make a move, they would evaluate what was more successful. So if you started using the bases or mines, bases a lot, you'd find your bases under constant attack. And if you were using ships for refuel, it would ignore the bases and attack your ships. It was, it was kind of clever. It was a little over ambitious, but it ran okay, and uh, and uh, you know I had some success with it, and it was pretty nice that I could just come out of the gate with a game like that and get some sales. And Avalon Hill did a great job on the box. People don't remember this, but when Avalon Hill started doing these games, most of the games shipped in plastic baggies, and they were hung on pegs in the computer stores. Avalon Hill was one of the first companies to ship in attractive boxes. Once again, because they were vertically integrated with Monarch Publishing, Monarch Printing, they could afford to do that. You think we've lost something by all the digital downloads now, digital distribution? Well, you know, it's like everything else in the world. There, are, I miss. I mean, I miss record, record albums. You know, the big record albums. You know, I've got a couple of record albums in my house somewhere that are just gorgeous record albums. That's gone. So we we're missing the packaging, and 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 there was fun in the packaging. I remember with Return to Zork, we shipped an encyclopedia of Robiz, Robaz, encyclopedia of Zork, and there were other funny packages. Someone was showing me something on Facebook 
that they had a CD game and it said, um, warning, image on other side, highly objectionable. And of course, the other side is a shiny disc, it's a mirror, but that's a funny joke. I mean, and they did that in the game and people still talk about it. Um, I remember when we did the first CD-ROM game, the second CD-ROM game, we did Manhole, the CD-ROM game, which is a beautiful CD-ROM package. Man, Cosmic Osmo, which was Cyan's second game without Activision, uh, we had a holographic package. The disc had a hologram on the front of the game. We actually shipped the product out with a hologram on the front of the package. Let me see if I can show you a picture of that. Um, yeah, so uh, Alan Hill did boxes in an age when people didn't want to do boxes. And they would often put interesting things in the boxes. Back then, copy uh, theft was a big problem. So people would, like in the case of um, Lords of Commerce, it's coming back to me, there was a parchment-looking book and the story in there, and the game's copy protection was to reference page and, and line items. What is the fifth word on the fourth line of page 35? You've seen this. So uh, Lords of Karma did that. Lords of Karma was really quite underrated. Great game. I didn't write it, so it's not my game. I'm just saying it's a great game. Um, so uh, back to the Voyager 1 sabotage, sabotage of the robot ship. I was really so, so amazed at the screenshots of this. I had to keep looking back at the date to make sure. Is this really 1981? This looks you know, more like something you see in the 90s. I was and, insane. <laughs> That's the only way so to describe it. So you did that whole, all that programming by yourself, right? Yes, well, except for one example, exception. On the Commodore PET, this is before the C64 and the VIC, the PET didn't have line drawing graphics. So I found a guy named Butterfield, I think he was in Canada, who was a Commodore PET maniac. And he gave me a line drawing routine and assembly for the pet. So there was actually a version of this that ran on the pet with vector graphics, which is loony. I mean, look at the TRS-80 version. Look at the IBM version. I mean, first of all, Voyager. I did Commodore Pet, TRS-80, TRS-80 Coco, Apple II, Atari 800, uh, uh, IBM PC, DOS 1.0. Um, that's six versions all by myself. And... The game had randomly generated levels. The levels were randomly generated. Um, it had 3D graphics, I object force perspective, north, east, south, and west. It had two ways of playing. Um, it had an auto-generated map. The map on the right, or the, or the map screen, the map screen, I'm thinking of another game. The map screen only showed you what you had explored already. And I basically recreated this in a sort of shaded graphic version on the Macintosh in a game called Pyramid of Peril in 1984. But Voyager was really ambitious, and my whole goal was to build an engine on that. You know, yes, it was a combination of basic and assembly, but my next goal, had I stayed in the independent game thing, would have been to do it um, with um, all assembly language and to get the shapes to be more interesting and the scenery to be more valid. I, I, I actually figured I could actually use this sort of fractal generation thing to do whole scenes and stuff where you'd walk into a a new zone and would sit there and generate the world so you wouldn't have to um, to store it on the in the memory and I was going to use random number seeds to make sure they're always the same. Yeah, it was pretty impressive. Um, and it, 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 there are a couple gameplay mistakes I wish I hadn't done. It had this concept of you lose energy by moving fast and fighting and you regain it by resting. Uh, and I wish I had just done the potion idea that came out in Doom. That was brilliant. You know, screw that. Just have potions or health packs, and, and that's the way to do it, you know? And, and I, I did that in uh, Pyramid of Peril, which is the Mac game later on. So, yeah, Voyager was really ambitious, did well. One of the things that was going on in the industry was a little bit of what I would call liar's poker. Back in the early 80s, we used to think that everyone else was doing way better than I was. So I once had a conversation with Bill Budge, and he told me how much he had done in terms of sales numbers, and I was like, Oh my God, I did almost as much. That, and, and at the time, I thought I was doing lousy. I thought like, oh, I only sold, there's only uh, 60,000 copies of Voyager 1 sold. That's terrible. <laughs> well, over 50,000. The point is I made $50,000 on the game and it only took me a few months to write. So, yeah. And, you know, there you go. So.
that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Bill Volk. A lot of great stuff coming up, including his time at Activision and Return to Zork. So stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you very, very much. If you have helped to support the show, it really means a lot to me, guys. It's very needed as well. Uh, so if you want to support the show, you can do that in two ways. Uh, one is to make a financial contribution. Uh, just go to armchairarcade.com. Look for the Match Hat link in the top right corner. You can set up a subscription there or make a donation of as little as a dollar a week, a dollar per month. You know, a tiny amount of money, but I really appreciate it, guys. And believe it or not, it really does help. A second way is to help spread the word about the show. If you've got friends uh, that are interested in this stuff, you can send them a, an email, post about it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Um, all that stuff really helps, and plus it uh, gives me a real kick to see people discussing uh, these interviews and other things about, the, about my work. Uh, so thank you very much. Now what about that ale of the week? Well, uh, this week I've got a spicy ginger. I'm a huge fan of Doctor Who. Uh, hopefully you know <laughs> what that is. And uh, Tom Baker in particular. And I remember he talks a lot of, uh, there's a couple episodes where he talks about how much he loves ginger beer. So I'm always on the lookout for this beverage whenever I can find it. Unfortunately, it's very rare here, at least in the United States. Uh, some of you guys from uh, Britain might tell me what it's like there. But anyway, I had to search high and low to find it. But I got lucky this week with something called Spicy Ginger by Goose Island. That's a brewer out of uh, Chicago, I believe. Uh, they do a Honkers Ale. I think they have an Urban 312 a Wheat Ale couple different varieties but uh, this is their ginger beer so I was very excited to see this it's a uh, there's not a lot of information here about it other than it's a uh, hundred percent cane sugar apparently all natural uh, so let's get it open and see what it's all about all right so I have some of the spicy ginger here in the rather excellent drinking horn this smelling this you definitely smell the ginger quite strongly not overpowering you know I'm not like wincing here but you definitely tell it's got some ginger in it. it smells pretty good. Very uh, light, refreshing kind of uh, aroma here. Anyway, let's give it a taste. What is that? It kind of tastes uh, like a cream soda. We just the, the ginger is very uh, light uh, in this uh, spiciness. I'm not really tasting a lot of heat. You know, people that like these uh, ginger drinks. I like to talk about the ones that are really hot. They sort of burn your throat going down. Uh, this one, though, you don't really taste that at all. You don't feel the heat, uh, so to speak, of the ginger. Uh, it's kind of lightly flavored. There's not really a whole lot going on here. You can definitely taste a little bit of ginger. Uh, the sort of carbonation uh, from the... Uh, you know, I guess I would describe this if you took a, like a cream soda and put a little bit of ginger in there, or you might create a flavor like this. Unfortunately, it's not really as spicy as I would like, especially considering it's called spicy ginger. You know, you kind of want something that's really going to knock your socks off. But anyway, it's definitely not bad. Uh, I'm going to go maybe, uh, well, let's give this, uh, I'm kind of torn between two and three, but I guess I'll go two out of five uh, drink, drinking horns on this. I definitely had ginger beer that's a lot stronger, in my opinion, better tasting than this one. Uh, so there you have it. Okay, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And uh, for the quotation of this week, I found something from W.C. Fields. And it goes something like this. I kind of modified it uh, just a little bit. I love cooking with beer. Sometimes I even add it to the food. See you guys next week. Two of us, Captain Avatar. You were right about the cool, fresh spring water you talked about. Now it's flowing again, and I drink a toast to you. And the Star Force in those wonderful days. You held that old ship together with your bare hands. And all those kids, oh, what they learn from you. To work hard, to believe, and to love something outside themselves. Oh, uh, Mimi, you're sad too. Here, have some. <laughs>